Welcome, everyone. Come on in. It's Stories Lost Time, and now we have three unique encounters that are really something else. In the late 1970s, Sweden became the setting for a series of unusual and mysterious encounters involving humanoid figures witnessed in remote areas. Three separate sightings occurred within a span of months, drawing the attention of UFO Sweden, a prominent Swedish UFO research organization. These cases took place near Mersel in Jämtland, Sundsvall in central Sweden, and Pajala in the far north, and involved a series of eerie similarities. Tall, human-like figures appearing within confined light sources, each emitting a distinctly unnatural glow. Yet each case also held unique and puzzling differences. In Mersel, the figure stood within a crackling yellowish light that suggested an almost military silhouette. In Sundsvall, a glowing red object was accompanied by a shadowy human-like profile. And in Pajala, an object and its figures unexpectedly took flight in a vertical ascent. Despite thorough investigations, conventional explanations like pranks, car lights, or natural phenomena were systematically ruled out. These three encounters, each investigated, documented, and cross-examined, left more questions than answers. As we explore each case in detail, we find ourselves face to face with one of Sweden's most compelling UFO mysteries. We'll start off by comparing the first and second sighting. On August 4th, a humanoid sighting occurred outside Mersel in Jämtland, and on September 16th, a similar sighting was made on the outskirts of Sundsvall. Both sightings share certain characteristics. No traditional flying saucer was observed nearby, both entities were seen within or near a localized, unusual light source, and both measured between 1.5 and 2 meters tall. However, there were also differences, such as color and sound. The first sighting involved sound, while the second did not. Thorough investigations were conducted at both locations. We begin with the first case, from Röman, outside Mersel. UFO Sweden's two field researchers, Kurt Persson and Anders Berglund, from the Östersund UFO Association, conducted an in-depth site investigation, took soil samples, and performed calculations and measurements according to established standards. In their investigation, the observer, 16-year-old Lars Westerlund, recounts his experience as follows. It was August 4th, 1978, around 11 p.m. I had been out with some friends grilling sausages and was now walking alone along the lake shore in the forest. It was completely overcast, but it wasn't raining, and the air was completely still. I came to a fence with cows on the other side, and suddenly, all the cows came running past me as if something had scared them. I jumped over the fence and continued until I was about five meters from a military bunker when it happened. There was a light, about three meters high and one meter wide. Inside the light, I saw the outline of a figure that resembled a German soldier from the First World War, with that distinctive helmet. The creature was about two meters tall and stood within the light phenomenon, which crackled louder than a fire. The light flickered, shifting between white and yellow, and was confined to the dimensions I mentioned. The creature within the light was standing beside the entrance to the military bunker and did not move. I watched it for about a minute, maybe less. Then fear hit me, and I ran as fast as I could to get away. I finally reached the main road higher up and met a friend. He had seen something glowing down there but could not see any details. The investigators were baffled by this account. The initial hypothesis was that one of his friends had tried to play a prank on Lars Westerlund. However, staging such a show would require extensive technical resources. Kurt and Anders also considered the possibility that some kind of military alarm mine had triggered the light phenomenon. Initially, the investigators considered the possibility that the strange light phenomenon witnessed near the military bunker outside Mersel could have been caused by a type of military alarm mine. These mines, sometimes deployed in restricted areas, are designed to trigger a response, often involving bright lights, loud sounds, or smoke, to alert of unauthorized entry or potential threats. The characteristics of such a device seem to align somewhat with the witness's account, a localized intense light accompanied by a crackling noise, as if from an electrical source or fire. 
Given the proximity of the sighting to a known military site, this theory appeared plausible at first. After consulting experts and conducting test firings with alarm mines, this theory was dismissed. Soil samples analyzed at a government institution showed no indication that anything conventional, like chemical combustion, had caused the light source. The idea of a prank was also ruled out, as no one knew Lars would walk along the lakeshore. It was a spontaneous choice. At this stage, we can only conclude that Westerlund experienced a UFO phenomenon, and in repeated interviews, he has honestly conveyed his account. He himself holds no particular opinion about what might have caused the phenomenon, nor is he inclined towards theories involving flying saucers or aliens. The second humanoid case took place on September 16, 1978, on the outskirts of Sundsvall, a city on Sweden's eastern coast surrounded by forests and low hills bordering the urban area. The sighting occurred in the Granlo neighborhood, near the end of Limbovägen, where the road meets a more secluded, wooded area. Granlo is a suburban district with open green spaces, grass clearings, and patches of dense forest, often used for jogging and walking. It was in one of these grassy clearings, partially enclosed by trees, that 18-year-old Jeanette Eckluff observed an unusual phenomenon. The setting, a semi-isolated area in the early evening, formed the backdrop for her encounter with a glowing figure deeper within the wooded edge. UFO Sweden district head, Loy Soli, together with Krister Bastrom, conducted a thorough site investigation and follow-up. In their investigation, Jeanette Eckluff recounts the event as follows. I was out jogging, and at 7 p.m., I passed the spot where I would later see the figure. At that time, I noticed nothing unusual. When I passed the location again, I saw something glowing a bit into the forest. I thought someone had made a fire, so I just glanced at it and continued. But after running a few meters, I stopped and went back, thinking it was a strange spot to start a fire. It was a large grassy clearing surrounded by forest. I stopped 25 to 30 meters from the light source. It wasn't a fire, but rather an object, about 2 meters high and 1.5 meters wide. It emitted a kind of glowing red light, but it was strange because it didn't illuminate the surroundings like a normal light source would. In the middle of the object, a dark line ran vertically. To the right of it were two parallel gray lines, but I couldn't understand what they were for. As I stood there observing, I saw something move out to the left side before disappearing. It was a completely black silhouette, looking like a human in profile. The head was about half a meter lower than the top of the glowing object. After the profile moved left and disappeared, I heard a rustling to the right of the object, but I couldn't see anyone there. There were also sparse bushes between me and the object, which may have obscured the lower part. I observed the object for about half a minute. Then it started feeling uncomfortable, and I ran home. Fifteen minutes later, I returned with my mother. We dared to approach the site because the object had disappeared, but we found nothing unusual. That night, I woke up drenched in sweat and couldn't fall back asleep for hours, but otherwise I haven't had any reaction to the event. However, I was curious and returned to the location with a friend the next day in daylight to check it out. We found some kind of impressions where the grass was pressed down, and they were quite strange and distinct. I made a sketch of them and decided to report what I had seen. Investigator Loy Solly remembers the events clearly. On the evening of the 19th, we conducted our first site investigation. By flashlight, we searched for the impressions in the grass, but found nothing. The investigation resumed in daylight the following day with the same negative result. Jeanette was present and could not see any trace of the marks she had observed three days earlier. The grass was frosted, and there were half-circle tire tracks from cars and mopeds on the clearing. The impressions Jeanette and her friend found on the ground were about two meters from where she observed the object. She felt a bit embarrassed that the marks had disappeared and thought it was strange. If we had been involved earlier, perhaps more could have been gained. Could Jeanette have mistaken the red tail light from a car or moped for the object? We arranged a reconstruction at 7.10 p.m., positioning a car at the specified location, with the engine off and tail lights or brake lights on. From Jeanette's observation point, it was very clear that it was a car and that it was on the ground. 
comparing this with her account, where she didn't perceive whether the object was on the ground and couldn't see the lower part through the sparse bushes. We ruled out the possibility that she had mistaken it for a vehicle. Despite investigators' efforts to reconstruct the scene using car lights, they found that this hypothesis didn't align with Jeanette's description. She couldn't tell if the object was on the ground, nor could she see its lower part through the sparse bushes. In the end, this line of inquiry hit a dead end, leaving the whole sighting unexplained. In repeated interviews, the investigators attempted to trick the witness, Jeanette Eckluff, into changing her story by posing leading questions. However, she remained clear about what she had seen and did not waver in her account. Loy and Krister were forced to back down and pursue other lines of inquiry. Checks with the company responsible for power lines in the area showed no disturbances or discharges. Other routine checks revealed nothing that could explain this as a simple mistake. Follow-up investigations have not helped to solve the case. Jeanette Eckluff's observation thus remained categorized as a UFO slash humanoid sighting. Now for the third sighting on December 18, 1977, outside Payala. UFO Sweden district head, Gunnar Thorin, conducted a thorough investigation of the case. Forestry worker Bruno Nygård recounts his experience. It was around 6.30 p.m., and I was heading home on my kick sled from the village of Kaunasvara. As I turned onto the main road from a side road, I saw, about 70 to 80 meters away on the right side of the road, what I thought was a couple of young boys pushing a sled with a large box on it. They were running on either side of the box, so I thought they had attached a board to the sled so they could run alongside it and push. I didn't see any details because it was dark and there was only light from the street lamps. There was nothing that made me think it was anything unusual. I just thought the boys were traveling on the wrong side of the road and that young boys come up with their inventions. Bruno assumed that the box was perhaps modified with a board attached to make it easier to steer from either side. Given the dim light from nearby street lamps, he didn't initially find the sight unusual and assumed the boys were simply unconcerned with traffic rules. Bruno continues, when they got a bit closer and I myself was a bit nearer. Finally, we were about 20 meters apart. They stopped and I thought they were standing and talking on either side of the box. Suddenly they both jumped up and landed in the box from above, both at the same time. What I had thought was a box on a sled now shot straight up. I stopped and swore out loud, realizing this was anything but normal. The box rose at a relatively high speed straight up to about 200 meters, where it made a 90 degree turn and then flew eastward, disappearing behind the treetops. At the same time that the object rose, I saw that it wasn't a box, but a round object, about the size of a snuff box. The diameter was closer to two meters and the height about one meter. By snuff box, I mean the kind currently made, Circular, Bruno said. Swedish snuff boxes, or snusdoser, are small circular containers used to hold snus, a type of moist tobacco popular in Sweden. Historically, snuff boxes were crafted from a variety of materials, including silver, wood, horn, and even bone. Modern Swedish snuff boxes are typically made from lightweight plastic or metal and are designed to be compact and functional. Most are roughly circular about two inches in diameter and one inch in height, which fits conveniently into a pocket. The box-like object that Bruno observed bore the shape of a snuff box, but on a much larger scale. It was circular, approximately two meters in diameter and about one meter high. Gunner had a hard time trying to describe its outer surface. It seemed metallic and smooth, yet oddly featureless, with a faint mirror-like quality. He said, on the side facing me, it looked as though there was a small reflective area that caught the light from the street lamps in the village. The object itself was gray and completely silent, even though I was only 20 meters away. In silence, the object climbed to approximately 200 meters, executed a sharp 90-degree turn, and flew eastward, disappearing behind the treetops. I was quite surprised and stayed there for about 10 minutes. A couple passed by, and I talked to them but they hadn't seen anything. The entire observation, from when I first saw them, lasted a total of three to four minutes. Strangely, I found no tracks by the roadside. Standing by the roadside in the snow, Bruno found no mark in the snow, no footprint, no impression from a sled. He found nothing to indicate that anything unusual had been there at all. Still, he was adamant that his mind had not tricked him. No matter how unusual, strange, or weird, 
he knew his eyes could not have betrayed him. Now to sum up this arc of incidents in the late winter 77 and the early fall in 78. Each case, whether the silent ascending object in Pajala, the glowing red figure in Sunsval, or the crackling light and military silhouette in Mursil, defied conventional explanation. Despite extensive field investigations, environmental testing, and witness interviews, no physical evidence or straightforward answers surfaced. Clues remain just out of reach, pieces that refuse to form a clear picture. If we are to believe the Drake equation, which suggests that 0.001% of stars host advanced civilizations, does this bring us closer to the truth? Who knows what travelers may or may not drop by every once in a while. Like always on Stories Lost, we invite you to make up your own mind. As we all look for the signs by the roadside, and as the snow falls on the ground seemingly untouched, the silence is not that of assurance, but of watching and waiting. Will we see it? Will it come again? Will we believe our eyes? This was it for this episode. Thank you for tuning in and staying curious with us. As we work on our channel, we have acquired a deepened sense of appreciation for people's lives and experiences. We are truly grateful for your input, enthusiasm, and engagement. It makes us want to keep digging, discovering, reading, creating, and editing. Thanks again for your kind support, and we hope to see you next time. Let's see what else is out there. Together. Bye for now.